The music of Ireland and Scotland is some of the most recognizable cultural music in the world. When you hear Scottish pipes or an Irish fiddle, you immediately know where that music is from. But those unique sounds didn't just stay locked away in the old countries. In fact, you can hear their influence in one of the most popular genres of music right here in America. Of course, I'm talking about country music. European settlement in the area that would become Appalachia began in the early 17th century, well before there was even a country for country music to be named after. As territory along the colonial coast was gradually bought up, new settlers were forced to move farther inland. Many of these later colonial migrants were working class English, Scottish, Irish, or Scots-Irish. Either too poor to buy the expensive land that remained on the coast, or simply not wishing to deal with other people, many of the new colonists moved inland. By the end of the 18th century, nearly half a million Scots-Irish had migrated to America, with a large number of them settling deep in the mountainous frontier. The musical traditions these settlers brought from home would heavily influence the music that evolved in the Appalachian region. Traditional music stylings from Ireland are some of the most easily recognizable. Flutes, mandolins, harps are all prominent features of early Appalachian music. Ireland also provided what might be the single most important instrument in country, the fiddle. The fast, crisp Irish fiddling techniques were passed down, and in the isolated geography of Appalachia, they evolved without a lot of outside influence. American fiddling took on a new sound of its own, but you can still hear that old Irish accent underneath. The religion of these original settlers also played an important part. You see, many of them could not read, and even fewer could read music. As a result, other methods had to be used to help folks learn tunes and memorize hems for services. One of these methods was called lining out. This technique involved a version of call and response, and had been largely developed by the Covenanters in Northern Scotland back in the 17th century. Another method involved printing sheet music with pictures called shape notes rather than standard musical notes. And of course, there was the ancient practice of setting new songs to old, well-known tunes. Regardless of the method, the effort that went into teaching people music really shows how important it was to the culture of this region. Of course, music from the British Isles was not the only ingredient in the recipe for country. Another crucial element was the musical traditions of African slaves. In addition to rhythms and vocal stylings, one tangible contribution was the very special instrument the banjo. The American banjo is likely derived from a West African instrument called an akontik, which has a drone string and a hide-covered sound box. This unique instrument would evolve into one of country music's most iconic instruments and inspired generations of virtuosos. Central European immigrants who arrived in Appalachia later on also contributed to the burgeoning music culture yodeling and the mountain dulcimer became staples of the genre as well. Now you may be wondering what some of this music sounded like. Well, you can get a small taste by listening to some popular folk songs from mid-19th century America. And we actually have a great repository of that in the form of songs of the Civil War. You see, spurred on by the greater connectivity brought by the telegraph and the railroad, the music of the Civil War era became some of our first truly national popular music. Whether they were entertaining soldiers resting in camp or keeping spirits high on the home front, many of these songs borrowed or directly copied popular tunes from Ireland and Scotland. For example, Irish immigrant Patrick Gilmore wrote When Johnny Comes Marching Home as a more pro-war rewrite of the Irish protest song Johnny I Hardly Knew Ya. This hit became one of the most popular songs in the Union. Where is the leg with which you run, haroo, haroo, haroo? Where is the leg with which you run, haroo, haroo? 
where is the lake with which you run? So the Confederacy also had its fair share of popular music that borrowed old melodies. The Bonnie Blue Flag, for instance, also known as the unofficial anthem of the Confederacy, was set to a popular Irish tune by an Irish immigrant who came to America. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of Irish immigrants participated in the war on both sides and brought their own music with them. When the war ended, the troops took the songs and styles they had learned from their comrades home, further cross-pollinating the flowers of America's musical culture. And so it went. Then in the 1880s, a little gizmo called the phonograph started to gain popularity. Could you get recordings of Appalachian music now? Hmm, not yet. At first, studios only recorded classical symphonic music or opera, you know, high culture stuff. After all, this new medium was still a bit pricey. As the decades passed, more and more popular music filtered in. But by about 1920, recorded music still sounded pretty much like this. Pretty, um, vanilla, right? Well, I will give a small shout out here to one very important pop song of the era, namely Danny Boy. And if you want to hear more about that, check this video out over here. So the problem was that until after the First World War, major record labels did not want to branch out into more obscure genres for fear that it just wouldn't sell. Or they feared sullying their brand by promoting unsophisticated culture like that terribly gauche jazz or that hillbilly music. It would take another invention, the radio, to bring country to the world. You see, radio stations were eager to fill time and looked hard to find new and exotic acts. The so-called hillbilly music fit the bill. It was catchy, sentimental, and a bit nostalgic. Then in 1923, music executive Ralph Peer began producing some Appalachian music under a new and less derogatory genre name, Old Time. Peer had grown to prominence by endorsing the production of records in a variety of non-English languages for new immigrants. In 1920, he also recorded what is considered the first record for an African-American target audience, Crazy Blues by Mammy Smith. Pierre's first successful old-time music act was a Georgian man and local radio star named Fiddlin' John Carson. Carson's first recording, an old minstrel tune called The Little Log Cabin in the Lane, would sell out almost immediately. You can hear the Irish and Scottish influences in a lot of his songs, like this one. Suddenly, old-time music was totally in, and as we know, it was just the start of something huge. Over the last century, country music has changed a lot. In the process, it has become one of the most popular genres in America and a multi-billion dollar industry. Mainstream popular country music bears very little resemblance to the old-time and folk music that preceded it, though some subgenres are making efforts to preserve the traditions of early country music. Modern bluegrass, Americana, and folk all incorporate these influences to a much higher degree than today's popular country. One artist worth checking out, by the way, is Tyler Childers. His 2020 album, Long Violent History, is almost all old American fiddle tunes. Regardless of your opinions on country music, it's hard to argue that its creation isn't a uniquely American experience. Cultures from around the world contributed crucial elements to something that grew into something a lot bigger. It just goes to show you that strong roots go deep. History and tradition are everywhere you look, if you look hard enough. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully that was fun and a nice overview and whet your appetite for country music and its early roots. There's really a lot of great revival stuff out there if you take a look on YouTube and do the Googling thing. Check out Spotify Playlist, in fact. If you want some history on country music that we didn't cover in as much detail, check out the links in the description below. And if you want to hear more about Celtic culture and its influence on American culture, we do have some videos on that over here.